All right, we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, people filter in. They'll uh, miss the exciting beginning of the talk. Uh, hopefully, it'll still make sense. Anyway, this talk is called The uh, Edge of Normal. My name is Mark. Uh, I am a computer hacker. Um, you might know me by the hacker handle of uh, Simple Nomad. That's usually how I'd uh, gone before my past. Um, Actually, I kind of still do in, in some circles, but with this advent of, uh, you know, Facebook demanding you put your real name in or they cut you off. You, you can't have that, right? So uh, anyway, uh, I am a security researcher at uh, Duo Security. They're the 2FA people, uh, the, the good ones, not the bad ones <laughs> that you hate. And... Uh, I do research there for them, a lot of protocol analysis. In general, I look for exploitable patterns, which will be kind of a running theme throughout this talk. That does conclude the sales portion of my presentation. Uh, this basically doesn't have anything to do with, uh, with uh, two-factor authentication. I may touch on it later, but just to, as a theme in passing. Um, I wear a lot of different, I've worn a lot of different hats, and as a result, I've kind of uh, walked uh, a lot of different paths, and I push the envelope in weird ways, and so this presentation is kind of a continuation of that. I'm going to touch on some weird things, and I decided as an experiment to uh, uh, actually play around with the typical format of a presentation itself. So I wanted to touch on some things that you're not going to see in this presentation. Uh, you are uh, not going to see a detailed bio where I tell you about everything I've done and all my past employers and everything. If it seems relevant, I'll bring it up to uh, whatever I'm talking about so we won't have that. Uh, I'm not going to put an agenda slide up because there are ways to real estate, really. I mean, you know, just because you're going to say this stuff later anyway as a speaker, so I'm going to eliminate that. I absolutely hate bullet points in presentations. There's a lot of words up on the screen, and I don't like them. And um, uh, the most controversial one of all is that there's not going to be any memes or uh, GIFs. In this presentation, I uh, find also they take up a lot of real estate on the slides, and so... They might not be culturally relevant to everyone, so sometimes you put up a great example that only you find funny and no one else does, so I'm just nixing those as well. Yeah, so I just that's just the <laughs> so that's that's where we're starting from, all right? So uh, we'll start with a nice, uh, that you're going to see a lot of, a nice black hacker canvas to paint upon. <laughs> And we'll kind of get going here. Um, I wanted to talk first off a little bit. I want to kind of explore uh, kind of my take on society, how it seems to be structured, and at least in a way where I can kind of, you know, bring forth some other concepts later on that hopefully you guys will find uh, uh, interesting or at least somewhat uh, uh, entertaining to a certain degree. Um, and like I mentioned, I you know I wear a lot of different hat colors and and whatnot. I've done I've done my share of bad things. If I broke into your company in my youth, I'm sorry. Uh, probably not that sorry, but you know I am sorry nonetheless. It was it was a different time back then, I guess. Um, but in general, society I think of it as kind of a circle. Okay, think of it as kind of a circle. And there are things that happen at various points around the circle. Sometimes at the edges, things happen. Uh, uh, most people that are uh, that you encounter, including a lot of you, probably spend most of your time living in the normal part of society, where you're not faced with the scariness of what's going on around the edges, because sometimes it is kind of scary around the uh, the edges of society. 
Um, and there's nothing wrong with being normal. There's times and uh, multiple times in my past uh, where I really wish I was living a more of a normal life. Um, out there on the edges, you do find uh, what we call the crazies. And these are, I'm talking about the people that are there all the time, all right? They're right out there on the edge, and it's kind of, they're kind of, now it doesn't mean they're good or bad. I'm not meaning that kind of judgment. You have people that are like, you know, maybe someone like, say, Steve Wozniak might be considered a person that's right out there on the edge. Uh, and he's, you know, did weird things, came up with weird concepts and whatnot. But uh, then you also get like, you know, you know, Ted Kaczynski and people like that are also out there on the edge living all the time and end up, you know, killing people and stuff. So it is kind of weird. And, and crazies tend to look into the middle and see those normals as complete strangers. And they think of them as the crazies. Now, I mean, obviously, with the, what I'm referring to with these two different groups is it is kind of interesting to wander back and forth between these worlds. Uh, and to spend a little bit of time out there on the edge among the crazies is a lot of uh, a lot of insight can be gained from that. Now, when things happen, and this is part of that whole pattern recognition thing, when things happen out there on the edges, they tend to make ripples across all of society for good or for bad. And seeing some of those things is I've I've had a kind of a hobby of mine is making predictions about how things are going to go technologically, and I've been right a lot of times, but I mean, it's not that, it's not like I'm, you know, magic or anything like that. A lot of people have predicted the same types of things. But what it is, is you're just basically looking at some of these ripples as they come in and kind of identifying patterns with them and seeing where things are heading. Uh, you do realize when you're wandering around on those edges, though, things aren't just, I mean, it's, I've got a nice, neat circle here, but that's not how things actually are out there. There's times when uh, uh, things look really creepy and bad, okay? And for someone that's in the middle that ventures out, they're going to see something very horrid. And uh, for the crazies that live out there all the time, they're going to look in the middle and say, oh, my gosh, it looks so so bland and dull and boring in the middle. And why, why aren't you out here, you know, living life to the fullest, et cetera? Um, in a weird way, though, being an infosec you're having a lot of times to make forays out into those areas because you're dealing with technology, right? And technology is one of these drivers of these waves that come in repeatedly. And so that kind of puts a lot of us, probably most everyone in this room, I mean, you're out attending security conferences, trying to learn more and, and everything like that. A lot of your colleagues don't step out of the office except to go home. You know what I'm saying? I think, I think you do. Anyway, I, that's kind of why I put uh, a lot of us living kind of on the, the very edge of normal, kind of halfway in between. We can kind of see a little bit of both sides. It's nice to kind of pull back on the weekend or something and into more of the normal range, but, you know, or whatever your equivalent of weekend is. Uh, I think for me, it's usually sleep. Um, that's usually what I do to relax. Anyway, to kind of give some illustrations of how some of these things have kind of played out, I'm going to cover some items from the past. And some of these are going to be relevant as far as the uh, those ripples on that big big pond, big ocean or whatever. And uh, basically to give you some examples of this. Um, the first one, and this occurred, uh, this is back late 90s when it started, uh, the rise of uh, distributed denial of service. Uh, you, anyone remember when Amazon only sold books? It was a bookstore, remember that? Isn't that a weird thing? And then the denial of service attacks started happening and you couldn't buy a book for an hour and the New York Times went crazy because they're just like, oh my gosh, you know, the world's coming to an end. You can't buy a book for an hour. But I mean, that was the kind of things that were kind of going on then. There's also this other denial of service thing that would occur on occasion. Um, 
I know that Reddit is the new big thing now, but anyone remember Slashdot more in its, when it was more in its heyday? Uh, back then, if you had a, let's say you had some blog you wrote, and it's like some techno blog, and of course you had it on a web server that was like either sitting in your house or sitting at an ISP where, where you physically drove it and plugged it in, right? And this poor little server, once you, your neat tech blog went up, someone put it on Slashdot and everyone got excited and started going for it and all of a sudden your server was what they call Slashdotted where it would crash because it couldn't handle the load. Again, a form of denial of service. Now, there were some CDNs at the time, probably the uh, content distribution networks. Uh, uh, Akamai was a, um, a, a, the main one that I remember from back then. And what they did was they said, hey, we can turn this into kind of a business. Uh, we're going to um, uh, say, hey, you're tired of being you know, knocked off the net from being slash dotted or evil hackers with their botnets and whatnot. Uh, we're going to offer this up as here's a place where you can stick your, your web presence. And this is basically continue. They offered no security whatsoever. And trust me, there was no security whatsoever. It was so amazing to go in and change a couple of headlines on, on CNN via Akamai <laughs> because they left it pretty wide open. Uh, but, I mean, that was the beginning of the cloud, essentially. That's what the cloud is. That's the whole model is. There's some place where you put your content and people come and, uh, and, and grab it. Um, another big one was the, uh, the weaponization of cyber. Now, this is, we've all heard about zero days and all this stuff. And way back in the day, you would... Uh, find out about these things through um, uh, you'd be popped someone else would be popped and they put something out on say bug track and you'd find out about it that way uh, I think it was the early 2000s when someone decided they were going to start offering a brokering service and this was a uh, they kind of did IDS type stuff this particular company I don't even know if they're around anymore can't think of the name. The name s slips my mind, so they're probably not around anymore. Uh, but what they did was they offered money to hackers. They said, you give us your zero day. We'll buy it from you. Pay you cash. And when you do that, you know, we're going to work with the vendor and get the thing patched. And in the meantime, they're going to write a uh, IDS signature so their product would be secure from the bug they just reported to the vendor. And they thought that was a great model. I thought it was terrible. I wasn't the only one that thought this. I thought this is, this is horrid. I remember doing a panel back then, uh, and there was actually some people on the panel from a U.S. cert who agreed with me and had come to the same conclusion, said this is bad. Money being thrown into this realm is going to be a bad thing. And it has turned into a bad thing. I mean, we have, uh, you know, there's whole wholesale uh, zero-day things going on on the dark net all the time. People are buying and selling this stuff. At one point, the U.S. government, they did pay more than anyone else in an attempt to kind of corner the market and buy everything up. Uh, but still to this day, I, I have a friend of mine um, back in uh, Texas where I'm, where I'm at um, that I've known for a number of years. He started up a brokerage firm. They were in the black in six months, and he was a millionaire in a year. And he's taken a cut, all right? And that's all he's doing is he's just buying and selling bugs. So uh, that's, that's really kind of uh, affected things up until this moment. And then, of course, uh, the big one was the, uh, the death of the perimeter. Um, and maybe 15 or 20 years ago, that well, Frank Zappa had this quote. He was interviewed, and he was asked about what he thought about modern jazz, and uh, he didn't have a high opinion of it, but what he said was, uh, modern jazz isn't dead, it just smells funny, all right? And so I was saying that about perimeter security probably 
you know, at least 15 years ago. Uh, and I've since changed, <laughs> fairly quickly changed my mind into just saying, it is dead. Um, whether we want it to be or not, sure, there's a delineation, but uh, it is essentially dead. And that's kind of worth uh, exploring on its own as to what killed the parameter, because this gets more into that kind of, you know, waves that are coming in. Um, first thing that killed it uh, was laptops. I'm going to guess everyone in here has a laptop, okay? And most of your employees probably have laptops, even if they aren't corporate provided. They probably have a laptop, so they're used to being mobile. So if you have people that are chained to a desk with a desktop system, they're going to eventually probably be on a laptop anyway. It's just easier. They're smaller pieces of hardware, you know, that kind of thing. And, and they're going to they're gonna beg for it. That's, that's going to be one thing that uh, uh, really helped uh, kill the parameter. Um, the next one was, of course, wireless protocols, because I, we can pretty much probably all agree that Wi-Fi was a huge mistake that should have never happened, okay? It is a terrible, terrible technology. It is built upon, well, the main reason it is terrible technology is because the whole premise behind a lot of the protocols that already exist on the Internet require a physical element of security to them. And you can read through some of the RFCs for some of these things where it actually says, uh, by the way, there's a security issue if, if someone is physically attached to your uh, network. Well, that happens essentially with Wi-Fi. And so we've, there's entire things where we've gone through, like, you know, you shouldn't use free Wi-Fi. You should always, if you do, you got to use uh, encrypted this and that. And how can you trust the certificates? And entire presentations have been given time and time again. There's probably at least one where they're talking about Wi-Fi at some point at this conference and certainly at uh, at uh, DerbyCon as well. And I'm not talking about necessarily just Wi-Fi. Bluetooth also was another another horrid mistake. That is an extremely complex... Bluetooth is basically a conglomerate of sub-protocols to make this big thing that is overly complex... I don't know if anyone's seen the standard for it. It's like if you printed it off, it'd be like a phone book. It's it, Literally, it's the PDFs, plural, add up to about uh, 2,000 pages of technical stuff to cover everything in it, okay? Uh, and so that was a mistake. We shouldn't have done that. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, the next one was uh, uh, smartphones. Oh, there's a terrible mistake. Now, some companies, they did, you know, start giving them out to employees, but then they bitched and complained because they had to carry two of these things around, their home one and the work one, and eventually, we pretty, particularly when you had upper management saying, no, I'm not going to carry two phones, I'm going to carry one, it's going to be my, my iPhone, and because you, I'm not going to take that BlackBerry, it's dumb, I don't get it, you know, and so that's how that all came about. So essentially, really what it boils down to is what killed um, the uh, perimeter was uh, mobility. That's really what did us in because we wanted a mobile user base. Well, the users wanted it more than we did. We're obviously reaping the benefits of it. Everyone here has probably, you know, at some point gotten on their phone to check email with work or some other thing or they're Communicate. I've been communicating via Slack, you know, to uh, Slack using my Slack app with work and stuff like that. Granted, I'm doing it over the, over against my data plan. I'm not using the network here because I don't, I don't really trust it. But I'm sure it's fine for everyone else. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to try to keep a straight face to that one. I just couldn't do it. All right. Well, that's the uh, kind of the the past. So we're going to get into more of the present, things that are going on right now that are kind of, uh, kind of interesting. Um, infrastructure adaptation. Uh, 
we're moving to a cloud, okay? That's a given. I know I've spoken to a few people here that just said, no, we're not going to do that. You know, we're going to we're going to keep control. You will move to the cloud. Eventually, there will be services that you want to use. There will be applications that your user population will demand uh, that will that are cloud-based, and that's where you will end up heading. Uh, so that's kind of this, you know, ties back to that whole rise of DDoS. This is where we're at now. The cloud is uh, is uh, pretty much uh, everywhere. Uh, this next one, I really wasn't sure how to say this, so I just went ahead and went for it. Okay, smart shit. I, I just all the smartness that we're included because you know you need to be able to ping your toaster. Okay, that whole idea of putting an IP address, Bluetooth, uh, everything on these various devices. Uh, that is a reality. As someone, I'm going to be doing a presentation at uh, DerbyCon on on uh, uh, Internet of Things stuff, and it's and it's it, this is a I, the word shit is extraordinarily accurate for a lot of this stuff. Okay, just trust me on that. So that's that's another thing is happening. And uh, the last uh, thing that's really kind of uh, interesting here is the death of privacy. Uh, this is not a, a popular subject, uh, but essentially, we've the privacy is dead now. I know that uh, a number of years ago, Scott Neely, I guess the Sun guy, said, uh, uh, "You know, privacy is dead. Get over it." And I mean, I mean that was harsh the way he said it. And, and particularly within the context, because he was, I think he was actually spitting as he said it. He was pretty hostile about it. But that is essentially kind of true in uh, many ways. And um, I wanted to talk about, because that was kind of an important one, that why, why it's, uh, why it's dead. Um, the first one is probably because we've entered into this social media type thing and we are probably all doing it to some some degree okay everyone is probably doing it to some degree sure you can say facebook uh twitter that would count because you're kind of putting yourself out there in a certain way facebook's a big one though um there are the ones that seem obvious when you talk about selfie like you know instagram or snapchat and these kinds of things and i'm not uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn is a big one, okay? That is actually a big one. You're putting lots of nice, juicy information in there about yourself, saying, you know, here's where I work, here's here's my skill set. Uh, when I was at this job, I did this, I did that, and you can pretty much build up a pretty good profile. There are attackers. This is previous job when I worked for, um, we only had one customer, which was the U.S. government. Uh, we were starting to see then that attackers were the the ones that were being thwarted by even their zero days getting in they would start becoming friends with every person they could with the uh on linkedin with the target individual or someone that worked at the target organization only to say oh here's my resume can you after they became friends and chatted with them and stuff like that so oh here's my resume and then you write back say, hey, your resume was corrupted. Just came up blank, something's wrong. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, here's the right one. And then they send in a correct resume. You know, the whole premise being, hey, can you give me your opinion on this as, a, as an attractive person that would know how this is wonderful? You know, and saying all those flattering things. In the meantime, the person has been popped and, you know, lateral movement, et cetera, et cetera. This is, uh, but this really has kind of destroyed uh, a lot of uh, a lot of privacy as a result because we're all participating in it. Uh, commoditization, just everything about these products, it could be, is there's been an ease of use that's been uh, slowly coming into all these products. It used to be really hard just to get onto the internet 
and it seemed like a major miracle that you would send packets across this creepy network and it would actually they'd make their way there you know it was just like wow it made it all the way there and and my answer came all the way back you know and so when someone would complain and say it's slow just like you have no idea how hard it was for it to work in the first place you should look at the protocols how they're written it's amazing but everything has been commoditized now and there's this ease of use element now it has a bad effect for a lot of us is that we tend to blame the user a lot of times for things when they go wrong which is in my opinion that's not what we should be doing if really i mean if there's if the users are having a hard time with something i blame us okay not necessarily infosec but you know like in particular but as technology people we have failed the user community i mean if you work at a shoe a shoe store you know one of these major brands that puts out shoes all the time you hired a an expert at selling shoes we're then saying oh you also have to be an expert at determining what a phishing email looks like and they could care less about that kind of thing they're trying to make sales or trying to make quota they were an expert in selling shoes they're an expert in sales they don't care about it because they will do the minimum of, oh, i'll get on passwords in a minute i just i'll go on a rant about how terrible we've we've given the things we've given to users and tell them that it's okay trust us um probably the last thing that's uh really been uh uh, killing us is uh, just this whole everything out there is a service of some type. As we continue cloud adoption for any number of things, everyone wants to put their data in the cloud. A lot of people don't know how to secure that data. They sit there, and really, it's not even the cloud's fault. I mean, if you put data up on uh, AWS, and it, AWS will securely serve it up regardless of how pathetic your permissions are on that data. So if you didn't secure the data right, <laughs> AWS will go ahead and hand it to anyone who asks for it securely. You know, they'll you make sure that the, all the, uh, all the uh, encryption is in place and everything to make sure that uh, transmission goes right into your browser. But uh, that's that's a kind you know that's a part of it and it just that is eroded privacy because there are people that are gathering this data from multiple sources and 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 pulling this together and that's kind of the uh real paranoid me talking but there you have it so let's talk about the future a little bit and this will be near term we'll get into longer term and it'll get really weird but right now we'll get into a uh, near term stuff and I'll kind of whip through these um mainstream journalism um this is the main reason why end users and the general population uh, really doesn't get what we do okay they don't read the trades outside of the trades uh you get into mainstream media and i swear to god you get a better explanation of technical issues like okay i saw this great thing on uh on the last week tonight with john oliver that explained encryption and explained the whole thing with you know when the uh government wanted into the the attackers the some terrorist guys iphone and so they did a bit on encryption and it was you know look it up it's like about i don't know 20 25 minutes long but it is a beautifully put together thing intended for a non-technical audience that completely explains encryption and it does so very good and it kind of presents both sides of the uh the encryption argument law enforcement's and uh and uh other people's uh the other one that's kind of funny is uh teen vogue has changed their editorial uh staff slightly and so when Teen Vogue writes a tech article, they're getting it right. And that is amazing. I follow them on Twitter now. There's a contest in my group at Duo 
to see which one of us can be quoted or interviewed by Teen Vogue first. Okay? <laughs> I'm not kidding. I think there's, you know, alcohol in the line for this contest. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing. This is to, to give you a kind of a state of the way things are, is that you can trust a, a you know, a comedy satire show and Teen Vogue to get it right. And you can't necessarily trust mainstream media who are saying things like, oh, there's, you know, the, the remember when the Samsung, this came out about maybe in the past year, it was this, the Samsung TVs, you know, hackers can spy on you with their, you know, because they can backdoor Samsung TVs. All right, well, yeah, they made a big deal about it, and they said that's what the CIA was doing or someone, I, I don't know. This has had to do with releases from WikiLeaks and, and whatnot. But anyway, the the point was is, just, is that, yeah, a hacker could do that if a hacker went in and had rewritten firmware, custom firmware for one particular model of uh, a Samsung TV and they physically break into your house go to the thing bolt, bolted to the wall and find the USB thing and go in there and do a bunch of stuff to it. You know, because just setting up a, you know, a microphone would be, you know, so much more complex than that. Oh, and also, this was, uh, it was first discovered in 2013, and one of my coworkers presented on it at uh, either Black Hat or DEF CON that year. So this is something that was like, it's, you know, it was like, you know, four years old by the time it made mainstream press. And it was just like ridiculous. But that gives you an idea of just how things are going. Um, another one is uh, politics. And I'm going to lump in uh, cyber insurance into this. Uh, we all know how much the auto industry and auto automobiles in general were influenced by uh, the advent of the... Uh, insurance uh, industry it created whole new facets and wonders and there's even laws where you have to have a apparently you have to be insured to drive and all this other kind of stuff all these crazy rules that they have now well i would expect that between the politics of having politicians who don't understand our world making knee-jerk reactions to these headlines like we mentioned previously that we're going to end up with particularly with the people that are doing the cyber insurance stuff, they're going to start uh, really making a uh, huge impact on all our, all our lives. Uh, this, I think, is going to happen uh, sooner than later. It's interesting, if you know anyone that's in the cyber insurance industry, talk with them. And uh, you probably will be like, ooh, that's, that's scary. Um, this is already kind of happening. I was imagining kind of a, IOT, ransomware, phishing is all just going to kind of merge. And I'm not really going to delve too much into phishing and, and, and ransomware, really, because, I mean, that's kind of, they're the hot topics right now. They're kind of the, you know, attack of the month, so to speak. Uh, there'll be something else that comes along that'll get another cool name uh, probably within another year or two, and then that will be the thing. I mean, well, this will still be there. It'll still be there for you know, just like, you know, people misconfigure systems and whatnot. But, uh, you know, between like, you know, uh, Mira, the Mira botnet and, and all that, where uh, you can kind of get into gray area where you say, okay, a whole bunch of home routers, if you want to call those IoT, then uh, they all got popped and turned into a botnet. Uh, that, cor that code, by the way, became open source. There's a framework, so if you find a new... Uh, IOT bug, you can potentially, you know, weaponize and botnet command stuff to go do things. And I mean, the part where I see where it actually ends up killing people will be when someone uh, uses ransomware and uh, takes over every smart coffee maker in the country and the entire. <laughs> United States is ground to a halt because no one can have coffee. You know, uh, that'll, that's, that's, and people will, they will kill each other when that kind of thing happens. It'll mass chaos, cats and dogs living together. Um, 
IoT will just become I, okay? There will no longer be an Internet of Things because everything will be on the Internet. We, we call it, I mean, how many people got a phone right now? Okay, you got a phone on you right now. I didn't say smartphone, but I said phone. You all knew what I was talking about. A few years ago, they were smartphones. Now they're just phones. They just accept, of course, they're really not phones. They're computers that, you know, show cat videos and, 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 uh, and, and send stupid text messages. Also, you can make phone calls on them, which most people don't do anymore. They use it for all the other stuff. Um, so you've got that going on, uh, that's going to be kind of interesting how that all plays out. It's just I have a feeling that uh, based upon, you know, what's happening, like in, is, uh, just imagine a day when your children or your grandchildren, depending on how old you are, they will know a future where the toaster always printed the weather forecast on the toast okay they will always know that they will there will not be a time when uh, that did not occur uh that uh, every toaster will be a smart toaster they'll, they'll just be called toasters and the old ones that aren't you know web enabled or whatever those will be known as antiques so vent or, or vintage vintage yeah there'll be yeah, uh, yeah. All of a sudden, you know, like uh, yard sales and uh, estate sales, when, when you know, granddad dies and he's got all these vintage electronic products in his house, it's just like that's what people will fight over. Um, Bluetooth, I think, is going to eventually kind of, I would hope, go away. Uh, and it'll kind of start to migrate to, to LTE. Uh, you see this already. I really didn't think it was going to be uh, Apple that did this, but it turns out it was. Uh, or uh, it turns out it was. I thought it was going to be Fitbit. We're going to do that. I'm going to speed up here, even though we started late. I'm still kind of running a little bit behind. Um, I think that multi-factor authentication is going to kill the password. Uh, password is practically dead. A lot of us use uh, uh, we use some type of uh, th thing like LastPass or, or you know or something like that, where the password is stored for us. It's automatically generated. It's massively long and complex. So in a way, we already don't know our passwords anyway. We're just heading that way. As soon as we get we get improved the whole biometric thing, I'm still curious as to whether like Face ID, how good that's going to end up being. And I'm real curious, it's like, and this is kind of the morbid part of me speaking, but like uh, if you could defeat that by, you know, like say someone died and you can like, you know, hold the phone up to their dead face if they died with their eyes open, I guess. I don't know, just curious. But uh, but nonetheless, I mean, as biometrics improve, I think this is, this is going to become a reality because the past, and that's the thing, think about this. We have two factor now because the first factor our first security element is insecure. Why do we have it? That doesn't make any sense. All right. Now, sometimes I do this for the show of hands. I'm not going to do that because uh, it's always the same. But uh, uh, just I'm going to go over this. I'm hoping that this becomes a thing. How many people can tell me, if just think to yourselves, if you have strong authentication on most of your apps? Okay, most of the things that you ask if you got strong authentication, saw so a few people nodding their head. Are all systems you manage patched and up to date? Okay, a few other people are nodding their heads. And then, is it just these patched and managed devices that access corporate data? That's the killer right there. Now, you, I mean, you can go and talk to all the vendors out there and everything like that about uh, I need to secure my stuff and everything, but these basics need to be done too. These really need to be done. If you can take care of that, that whole thing like uh, was said this morning in the keynote about covering 90%, this covers a huge chunk right there. Uh, all right, so 
uh, to kind of get into the long-term future stuff, and of course you're probably saying to yourself, is it going to be smart cars? He's going to talk about smart homes. No, it's not going to be any of that. My template for the future is power tools. Okay. This right here is a Milwaukee. Uh, this is a M18 drill driver. This thing is Bluetooth enabled. Okay. So you got a Bluetooth power tool. Okay. Why is this a thing? I mean, okay, you can do some cool things with it. Uh, I don't know if you can see very well in the slide there. They got the one through four on the, uh, that's on the base of it. You can store up to four profiles on it. Uh, it comes with an app, also a web interface to the website. All the data is stored on the on their website, which is basically in the cloud. Uh, there's some really neat features about this. Like, let's say that you're a guy that you know you're you're a construction company owner, and you got four of these drills, and your guys are out there drilling on stuff. Uh, two of the guys are over drilling, causing the wood to crack, and so they're having to go back as contractors and replace that wood and this extra work. And go in his uh, in his app, set up a custom profile for the tools, push it down to all the tools, and now the tools the torque has been adjusted. Okay, so now you got something kind of cool there. Is this the only tool they have that is uh, Wi-Fi enabled? No, it's not. They've got a few others. They're wanting more. They are extreme. I looked at this for work, by the way. This is a research project. I'll be, if you're going to DerbyCon, I'll cover a lot of this in detail. But uh, uh, you can do a lot of cool things with the tool, uh, and it has features like a uh, like you can say you can mark it as a, uh, you can take a photo of it and store it with the tool in the cloud, so you know what the tool looks like. You can take a picture of where it's supposed to go. You take a picture of the receipt tag that to the tool, upload it. It has, uh, and you can do this with all your tools. If you're a contractor, you could have your whole inventory of tools. They even sell this little thing they call it a tick. And you can put this thing on other tools so you can track other tools. It doesn't magically allow it to alter features, but it allows you to track from an inventory uh, part of it. You can mark things in inventory, like who's checked out the tool. Uh, if it's been lost, if it needs to be repaired, if it's been stolen, and you can actually, it does GPS detection. So if someone else is running the same app and, you know, the thief drives by with the tool, it'll pick it up. So that way, so the, you know, you, you'll know, that's the thing is, like a contractor could go to another job site, find someone that has one of his tools that, you know, left his job site and went there, that kind of thing. Uh, the tool community is going nuts over this because it's completely changing. I dare use the word disruptive, but I mean, that's, you know, buzzword you probably haven't heard today. Uh, but that's, but that's it. Um, here's one other, uh, disruptive thing that's kind of, uh, interesting. Uh, you'll look at that and you'll see that, uh, I don't know if you can really see it on the, especially toward the back. Uh, this is from my phone using an app called Light Blue. It does Bluetooth scanning. And I'm up there in the very top left-hand corner. It's in airplane mode because I was on a flight when I did this. And I'm scanning, and you'll look at there, the very top thing is Cali's hearing aids. Bluetooth-enabled hearing aids. All right, think about that for a second. By the way, I was able to connect up to Cali's hearing aids. And... Uh, get a bunch of information off of them. It might have been fun to, you know, Kali. <laughs> this is God. Give the rotund man with the gray beard all your money. Yeah, I could have had some fun with that one. But, I mean, this is kind of interesting because later, Kali got out her iPad I'm assuming it was hers. It said Callie's iPad. <laughs> and she starts watching a movie, okay? Because they functioned as headphones as well. And you start thinking about that and say, hey, wait a minute. I mean, I could be anywhere and like 
take a phone call and I can hear it, you know, just, you know, you, all of a sudden you're thinking, hey, this isn't just for hearing impaired people. I want to have better than normal hearing. I could do this, something with this. This might be kind of interesting. Or make a noise cancellation. Oh, that'd be really good. All right, a couple of real quick concepts, and then we'll uh, wrap this up. Um, for you uh, preppers and paranoids out there, the, the gray man, the gray man concept, you may be familiar with, basically hide in plain sight. You look like George Costanza from Seinfeld. You look like everybody. Therefore, you are not noticed at all, Okay. Uh, it's kind of an interesting concept, uh, and I put gray man. I mean, it could be a gray woman, okay, but it just, if you're going to Google it, you need to Google gray man, otherwise you're not going to find anything on it. I'm, that's not my fault. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, uh, nonetheless, I mean, there's a few of people I work with that we kind of play with this concept because, for one thing, using some of these gray man concepts really gets you through TSA security very quickly. You know, because they're looking for odd stuff. And I'll tell you this right now. If, as a computer security guy who occasionally carries weird electronic shit in his bag that I'm worried that it, the TSA is going to question, if I'm dressed very plainly, very normally, and I act like a normal human being, and I go through with that type of gear versus the guy that's got the, uh, the laptop covered in stickers you know, you know, EFF, you know, screw the man, and it's wearing an antisocial T-shirt and a utila kilt, okay, and he's carrying the same stuff. They're going to stop him and make him go check his bag and not me, okay? So, I mean, that's kind of, you know, kind of the way that I kind of use this whole concept. But it's also a fun thing. I was able to get through a lot of uh, Black Hat and DEF CON avoiding people I didn't want to have to talk to for various reasons, because I made sure I blended right the hell in. So that brings up the concept, which I think will become a thing, the digital gray man, okay? And you're in all these databases, privacy is dead and all that and everything. What would it take to make sure that the data is that's included in all these databases makes you look like a completely and totally average person, okay? That's the idea behind a, 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 you know, a digital gray man, hiding that way, hiding within all the data. You're, you want to use this stuff. You have to for work in many cases. What can you do to kind of deal with that? This is kind of my idea. I'm just, I'm hoping to get more into this. I need to talk with people that are involved with big data and discuss how we, one would go about that. It bothers me that someone says, oh, because you're right-handed and you're the age you are and you uh, have a car that's blue, uh, you have a 65% chance of owning a cat. You know, that, that, that kind of data gathering is just kind of creepy for me. That, that, I see a couple of people shaking their heads. I, I kind of exaggerated slightly, but not that much. There are people that gather marketing data like that, that are able to pull this inf weird information out so that when you go on Facebook and you post something about, uh, you know, whatever, they're able to read your likes and dislikes, and bam, you get served up ads that are specifically targeted for the way you are and the way you think. What can I do to change that? That's the digital gray man concept. All right, this is the last one. Uh, Human-machine hybrids. We already saw a little bit of this with Cali, our... Uh, our uh, frequent flyer uh, uh, cyborg. Uh, where is this stuff going to come from? Um, I think it's probably going to be come from the uh, the military. Uh, that'd be my guess. So we're going to start to see us and, and Japan. I mean, let's face it, Japan's going to be the first ones to clone people, right? Am I right? Okay, they're going to do it. All right, and uh, I, I and I'm all in favor. I know it may be controversial or whatever. I'm all in favor of growing a a headless clone of me that has, well, for starters, is going to have at least two livers in it. So as I, as I drink one out, I can just slap in another one, you know, but I can have it genetically engineered so that, uh, you know, my pancreas, because I'm, I'm diabetic, shocker that I'm diabetic, but, 
you know, I could have a new pancreas put in place. You know, I could have any number of parts replaced. I can improve my eyes for one thing. That'd be another thing to do. Um, but we're already, we're already kind of started down this path ourselves. Everyone, how many people put their cell phone? Oops, I used the word cell phone. I meant phone. I'm sorry. How many people put your phone in your pocket and it's the same pocket all the time? Yeah, there we go. Okay. And so what happens is when that phone buzzes, you know, you know, you know exactly what it is. And you can possibly tell the difference between the alerts from the, from the buzzing, what it is. Is it a text message? Is it an email? That kind of thing. I got a, uh, the, uh, I got the Apple watch on. I can identify four different types of alerts based on the haptic feedback sensor this and this you know because i i can't be troubled by reaching all the way into my pocket you know i <laughs> i can get it all right here i'm looking for there's haptic feedback shirts and i'm looking for some that are hackable because i think it would be interesting to have like you know someone came along and compromised the system the alert was a slide up the back you know if my shirt or you know tap here on the shoulder for a text here for an email but slide up the back in case you're system you're monitoring is compromised but i mean this is i think the direction we're heading i mean you have i think it's the military uh it's not going to be like in call of duty if an enemy drops a gun you can go and pick it up it'll be a smart gun it'll be biometrically linked to you uh you'll be the only one to be able to take it out of his charging station in the carrier because it's you know biologically linked to you by then we'll have the implants in the eyes for the heads up display you've already got Callie's hearing aids let's put in a jawbone microphone which are things that do exist make it look like something that's like jewelry that way you could be on a noisy battlefield and still get a cell phone I did it again still get a phone call or still get communication more importantly from uh, headquarters uh, giving you direction out there on the battlefield that kind of thing uh, my hope is that eventually, because we have an office down in Austin, and I live up in the Dallas area, my hope is that I can get in a car that drives itself. I can say, wake me up at the Starbucks, you know, in three hours, about, uh, you know, three minutes from the office, so I can get some coffee, and then just hop in the back seat of my self-driving car and have it drive me all the way there. And, you know, and then maybe my, you know, because I've got stuff inside me monitoring me, I get an alert from my doctor. Oh, by the way, you've got some type of thing going on. I'm going to give you a medication. Uh, there's a CVS at the next exit. We're going to have you exit here, and, and you can go in and pick up your prescription. It's covered by your insurance, and it's already been paid for, and et cetera. That's kind of the future. That's kind of the way we're, have, we're heading. I can tell from the people sticking their heads in, that we are over. I know we started late. I actually, believe it or not, roughly ended in 50 minutes. Uh, but we may have time for just a one or two quick questions. Please put them in the form of an answer to uh, save time. If you got any questions, if you want to come up and ask me afterward, I'll be around and out in the hall and all that. Anyway, thank you very much. I do appreciate it.